What's up guys, it's your boy CJ back once again and I have a confession to make. See this face of mine that you've all grown to know and tolerate's probably a little strong. But anyway, the truth is that this isn't my real face. That's right, real face reveal at 1,000 subscribers, so smash that like button. That's not how that works. Anyway, I do feel a little bit better after finally having gotten that off my chest. And it's not all I have to talk about today because in my retrospective of going through every Lupin series in pretty questionable order, to be honest, I finally arrived at the long awaited, at least by me, sixth entry into the Lupin franchise, Lupin the Third, part five. And following in the footsteps of part four, part five takes place in predominantly one major location, that being the great country of love and frog legs. That's right, so curl your mustache, pour you some wine, and do another third French thing because Lupin's finally coming home. Kinda. To France. Because he re And before we get into things, first off I want to say that I'm a big fan of Part 5, and like I said, I'm really excited to revisit it, as it was actually watching this series, though more specifically the subsequent OVA, that inspired me to go back and rewatch Lupin Part 1, and ultimately make my video on that and discover that Part 6 was coming out, and continue making videos to this day, obviously. And it was easily my favorite Lupin series until I rewatched The Woman Called Fujiko Mine to make my video on it. But Part 5 is far from perfect, and to do it any kind of justice, we're gonna have to take the good with the bad. Because if I'm anything, it's extremely biased. No, wait, the opposite of that. But before we dive into the story of Part 5, I want to, as always, take a look at the production of the series itself and check out some of the people behind the scenes and see what their vision of Part 5 was and how well they executed on it. Not getting off to a great start though, as I couldn't find any interviews on this series, so we'll just have to stick to finding out who worked on the show and what they've done before to try and glean any insight of what they might have had in mind for it. Starting with a couple notable names you might remember from my Lupin Zero video. Leading off with Daisuke Sako, who would go on to direct Lupin Zero, being Chief Animation Director, with Head Writer of Zero Ichiro Okochi homing that role in part 5 as well. So as we can already see with the power of hindsight, there are two people who know Lupin pretty well homing the series, with the biggest dark horse probably being the series director Yuichiro Yano, whose most notable credits come by way of the 90s Superman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures, as well as having animation credits as far back as the Puma Conspiracy movie and Akira. And now that we know the leaders of this project, let's try and see what their vision for this new version of Lupin was and how well they executed on it. But the first and most apparent thing about the direction Part 5 will be taking being one in a more modern technological direction, with the prevailing theme in the overarching plot being about how modern technology affects our world and its possible implementations in the future. With pretty realistic portrayals of social media, at least as far as your typical fiction goes, as well as the rise of AI-powered technology and the controversy controversiality of censorship online, I really enjoyed seeing and diving into the writer's thoughts on this stuff, with the locations in the show looking sleek and modern and phenomenal, as well as the constraints it puts on Lupin and the crew making for a super interesting challenge. As well as highlighting the particular strengths of a series like Lupin, and while the other modern Lupin series like parts 4 and 6 also use modern technology to a degree, it's far from the level of intrusiveness that this series reaches for, with the technology in those series usually used for convenience's sake. Like Lupin using drones and stuff to help in his capers, but part 5 swings the pendulum in the other direction to show how inconvenient technology can be to Lupin's lifestyle, to make for more interesting conflicts, at least in my opinion. And speaking of Lupin's lifestyle, this series also focuses in on who Lupin is, not just as a person, but as a concept, introducing a rival from the name from the past like Albert, and exploring the relationships between the crew a little bit more, especially Lupin's relationships with Fujiko, be it for better or for worse. As well as exploring some new characters introduced in the series, except Yada. He's just here, like always. So I guess with all that out of the way, let's hop into the meat of things and see how part five executes on its grand ambitions of bringing Lupin a little bit more down to earth and into the modern world. The series starts off with some shady individuals going over Lupin's enigmatic history, explaining how it's strange that somebody could be so sought after yet so elusive, with one of the guys saying that those qualities makes him a hero, starting right off the bat with trying to establish some kind of theme that Lupin and the way he lives his life makes him some kind of a hero, which is most likely, at least in my mind, a contribution by Yano using his past experiences with superhero shows. But that conversation leads right into the brand new, completely original opening theme. <laughs> Just kidding, it's a French version of the part 2 theme of course, as we once again see the return of Yuji Ono to the soundtrack, with the series continuing the trend started in part 4 of remaking classic tracks in addition to new original songs for the series, which I don't think I need to tell you at this point, freaking slap, and also includes the opening. Unless you're Italian! 
<laughs> once again. Getting back to the plot though, Lupin has his sights set on a Silk Road type dark web marketplace called Marco Polo for the next score. But in order to crack the digital safe as it were, he'll need a key. So in a nice sequence, we get to see Lupin and Jigen getting from point A to point B, traversing a large high tech server bank tower in order to infiltrate the second one beneath the sea. And I really liked getting to see them go through the motions here, as I feel most of the modern incarnations of Lupin skip the ins and outs of the heist these days, with it usually showing us the result rather than the process anymore, in a way to focus more on the plot, I'm sure, but I'm glad the series doesn't mind slowing it down a bit and putting us more in the process like the older shows did. Though I will say I didn't really care much for the motivation behind it myself, because to me the normal Lupin logic doesn't really apply here, he just seems to be after money, as opposed to there being any real point of artistry to the specific job. With this continuing him down the more stereotypical Robin Hood-esque direction that he's been taking more in the modern incarnations, probably as a result of the writers trying to tie him into the hero theme that they set up at the beginning. A little bit of a nitpick maybe, but I do tend to prefer Lupin's heights to have a larger goal to them than a big cash payout. I mean, let's compare it to part 4's first episode, which I like the idea of a lot more, as it focuses on Lupin trying to figure out a way to steal a super hard to get crown, rather than just money, even though in this instance it does come from an interesting target. Luckily though, I don't really care much about the target once we meet the hacker that Lupin's trying to enlist, who turns out to be the new girl for the series named Ami Anon. With Lupin posing as her father initially to try and persuade her to come with them, and despite her not falling for his ruse, Lupin is still able to convince her to come with them after showing off his thief skills, where she asks him to steal her in return for helping them out, immediately setting up intrigue into Ami's character, making us wonder why she was down here in the first place and why she was so resistant to leaving at first but now seems desperate to leave. So they make their way out and we see the people behind Marco Polo losing all of their money, with them now seeking retribution on Lupin, whose hideout has been discovered by Zenigata, leading the crew to go on the run which isn't easy with even more authorities chasing after them in a very Castle of Cagliostro reminiscent chase sequence. Once again, take a shot every time they reference this fucking movie. Which culminates in the gang at the airport to escape the heat, where Lupin is now some kind of celebrity, with everyone in the airport pointing their phones at him, trying to get a picture or video of him for the newest viral trend, the Lupin game. Which is clearly intended as a commentary on the nature of social media and society being so fixated on technology and social media that it eliminates a lot of personal privacy for the individual or others caught up in it, as well as the popularity of viral trends and how they can be used maliciously or be dangerous in nature, with time only proving these things more right than wrong, especially at least here in the West with social media challenges, like the most notable probably being the Tide Pod challenge, which actually happened earlier in the same year part 5 came out, and ended up being a dangerous thing many young people actually did, with it even causing damage to the company who makes them. And since then there have been so many other examples that it'd be pointless to go into all of them here, but I think this commentary here as well as its implementation of the story made for a very interesting setup to this first little arc, with the next couple of episodes continuing the Lupin game and even adding in more dangerous elements like a death pool on when Lupin gets taken out by a rogues gallery of referential assassins, including some pretty deep cuts, especially from the manga, which include... Which also of course includes Fujiko. Or does it? Well, not if Zenigata has anything to say about it, with him swooping in to sweep Lupin off his feet- I mean, save Lupin from defeat, before Fujiko supposedly takes him out, leading the trio of Pops, Lupin, and Ami to ultimately get stranded in the desert trying to cross the border, which is just rife with great character moments. Between Lupin and Zenigata, of course, but also from Ami, who up until now we've gotten to know a little bit, but for the most part has been pretty stoic and monotone. But thanks to the harsh conditions of the desert, she finally breaks and shows some emotion Ocean, culminating with her coming out on top in a life or death situation with a helicopter, where she begins to laugh and proclaim that she's still alive jubilantly. A short term character arc that I thought was great and really fun, seeing Ami go from a more or less emotionless person that doesn't really care about the more typical mundane things like normal food because it's inefficient or real life friends because she can meet more diverse people on the internet, with this experience highlighting the appeal of those things to her, with her trek through the desert especially highlighting the joys of living in the moment and triumphing over impossible odds. Only 
likely for their escape across the border to be hindered by the sudden appearance of a sniper who seemingly shoots Lupin in the head and kills him, which might have been pretty convincing if the sniper wasn't obviously hinted to be Jigen right before. As it turns out, Lupin faked his death with a mix of confusion and CGI graphics as a way to secure the pot from the Deadpool, as well as to take down the Marco Polo guys once and for all, with Lupin having a great standoff with the main guy behind it. Though I will say I was kind of a fan and kind of not for the way Lupin is teasing a more gray morality so far in this first arc, with the writers never really letting him take it all the way as per usual. Although Jigen and Goemon definitely don't get the same treatment here, with some of the action scenes in the first arc here not only being spectacularly animated, but also much more gory than most Lupin projects as well, which really helps it stand apart from the two series that bookend it. And after Marco Polo's taken down, everything wraps up in a nice return to status quo with Ami going off to attend a boarding school at the end. And all in all, I thought it was a great first arc for the series and just a great standalone arc in general, with all the major plot threads being tied up as well as Ami's hero's journey seemingly coming full circle in a really satisfying way at the end. In a way that makes it seem like she might have just been a one and done character even. Luckily though, at least in my opinion, since I know there's some people out there who don't like Ami, she does return later in the series, which I am all for since I loved her character and what she brought to the arc, even if the commentary from it is as simple as there's more to life than technology. But even beyond that, I think her being here helped elevate pretty much every character to their fullest potential, with all the old series mainstays firing on all cylinders. And even Yada has a pretty good showing for his first appearance. I can't wait until he'll actually be allowed to do something, right? Jokes aside, this arc was a great ride from start to finish, using the characters in new, or if not new, then at least interesting ways. While the themes it expresses are tight and well executed on, and it also sets up some interesting lingering plot threads for the future, like Lupin and Fujiko's relationship and what exactly happened to them before the series started. But before we can explore more of that, we have some filler! That's right, just like part 4, part 5 continues the trend of having more standalone episodes in between major story arcs. Unlike part 4 though, this part doesn't really try to connect them to the main story at all, instead using these opportunities to tell past exploits of Lupin and co, with each episode focusing on a different era in the franchise's history, with Lupin donning the appropriate jacket color for each era. Some more fan service, which part 5 excels at, with the first arc having already been filled to bursting with it. And because there's so much fan service, there's no way I can cover it all, so I'll just try and hit the highlights when they come up. But if you want to know all about the stuff I don't cover, then the Lupin Wiki is your friend. Back to talking about the series, though. The first standalone episode is a pink jacket episode. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, guys. I really don't want to talk about these one offs, but the video would be incomplete without them. So in order to find a solution, I called in a favor from a good friend of mine. And don't worry, he's a nice man. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lupin the Third at your service, joined by my partner, Daisuke Jigen. Lupin, why the hell are we sitting by a microphone? You're not trying to rope me into another podcast, are you? No, no, I've just got an uh, acquaintance who would love to hear about a select few adventures. I'm out. I've got whiskey. Fine, you got me. Uh-huh. You're too easy sometimes. Why don't you pick one from this pre-approved list? I haven't peeked at it yet. Hmm, let's see. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Do tell. Remember that time you had to open a safe by the Hirameki brothers? Hirameki? I'm not sure that name rings a bell. No wonder, you took quite a beating to get that one open. I'm sure I... Oh no, now I remember... Ah, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Finding out all the different ways to lower your IQ and open it up. Probably the most Fujiko and I have ever gotten along. Those big mallets were worth every penny. Jigen, you're my partner and all, but you are on thin ice. Thin ice. What? It nearly worked, and hey, you figured it out fine like you always do. Be that as it may, I still say that plan A would have worked just fine. Mm, live and learn, pal. Oh, hey, I, I think I hear footsteps. Oh, uh, now is it Pops? Nah, it's Fujiko. Oh, Lupin! She brought the mallets! Get me the fish, get me the fish, get me the fish! All right, well, after that zany filler, we find ourselves jumping into another arc that's more serious, at least, but is also borderline filler, being written primarily by Go Zappa, no relation to Frank, who started out as a mangaka, but seems to have transitioned to screenwriting when one of his manga, Shakoto's sister, was adapted into an anime, which 
doesn't seem like the best fit for Lupin, but since part five, Zappa's also gone on to contribute to writing shows like Kenken Ashura and Moriarty the Patriot, the latter of which seems to be right up a Lupin writer's alley, especially after part six. Unfortunately though, the only real thing of note introduced in the arc is Albert de Andresi, a former rival of Lupin's who apparently once competed with him over the title of Lupin the Third, with their paths crossing once again when Lupin happens to stumble on a little black notebook. One that Lupin can't help but to be interested in, which Albert uses to his advantage, getting Lupin to acquire it for him by disguising himself as an old friend and taking it from Lupin afterward, always seeming one step ahead of him until the very end where they have to team up to beat a politician using the notebook for his own political maneuvering. And if you're wondering how the notebook allows him to do that, it's because it's full of French government secrets. Secrets that if they got out will be massively damaging to the government and politicians within. Which is the reason Albert wanted it in the first place, as in order for him to steal the whole country of France, he was going to use the notebook in a similar way. Though Lupin gets the last laugh on him after their epic nighttime castle siege, as he switcheroos the notebook with a blank one when Albert goes to steal it at the end. And while I described this arc before as being borderline filler, because it doesn't really do anything to advance the main plot, as well the themes it focuses on have little to do with the overarching plot, with Lupin's past and why he is the way he is being something the main story touches on later, but is more or less a footnote in the end. So the only real thing of substance the arc introduces is Albert, which is still a bit of a stretch since he doesn't really do a whole lot afterwards either. Despite all that though, I think this arc was great, and Albert as a character was really well done here, with his and Lupin's rivalry being a fun dynamic that he's able to pull off convincingly, with the two seeming pretty evenly matched in their skills and cunning, which makes for an interesting back and forth that I think is great since Lupin having a main rival is a pretty new concept here, though it does push Zenigata more and more into secondary character territory, which I'm not too big a fan of, but this arc worked as a great introduction for Albert, as well as one of the smaller recurring themes for the rest of the show. That being what makes Lupin, Lupin, as we've now seen that he had to earn the title of Lupin the Third, rather than just being born into it as it's usually presented. Something Zero kind of reinforced and kind of contradicted in a way, which I find interesting since they were both written by Okochi. And I think Lupin having somewhat of a main rival outside of Zenigata is a great inclusion for moving forward. As I think the episodes of classic Lupin where Lupin has some competition, whether it be one on one or against a group are where he usually shines the most. So adding an arrival as a potential mainstay to the franchise opens up a lot of interesting opportunities. We'll just have to hope that the writers actually capitalize on that someday because they haven't yet, at least to the extent that this arc did. But it won't be in the next couple of episodes because we have some more filler. See you when the plot comes back. Apologies for the uh, technical difficulties there. Jeez, uh, Fujiko, you nearly gave me a concussion. Nearly? What a shame. Harumph. Anyhow, Fujiko here has agreed not to hit me over the head with a giant mallet, again, if she gets top billing. I'd say that's a fair trade, right, Fujikakes? Greetings to all my adoring fans. This is Fujiko Mine. Now, what are we discussing? Well, I'm thinking of the time we all went off to South America. Right, uh, which one was that? I'll give you a hint. It involved you effortlessly seducing the location out of our targets, camping together in the jungle, and several vehicles falling to pieces. Uh, Lupin, do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Well, here's another hint. I spy with my Lupin eye something that starts with P. Right, 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 right. Wait, the Pablo collection? Lupin, you! Hey, 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 no mallet, you promised! Ugh, fine, but really, what's worth discussing about that? You were a horny idiot, the jungle was the worst designed racetrack I've ever seen, and we walked away entirely empty-handed. Well, when you put it like that... I had to take a shower in the jungle. Also, we could look at a scrapyard. I nearly drowned, for Pete's sake! Drowning in the shower? That's not how I remember it. Ugh, whatever. You keep this little... I don't even know what it is. Hey, Lupin, your uh, acquaintance called, says he needs your podcast by Monday. It's not a podcast. Uh, sweetie, we can change topics. Can't you stick around a bit longer? Sweetie? Get going on to show up for all I care, buddy. Huh. Uh, this day just keeps getting better and better. Oh, also, we're out of booze, so I'm heading to the store to buy more. See ya. Already? Wait, where's my wallet? We're back, and, uh, Goemon, would you please say hello to our audience? Hmm. Uh, going on that red light means we're recording. I failed to see the purpose. Never mind that now, just trust me on this. Here's a list, just, uh, pick something extravagant and, uh, talk about it for a while. It was nice of you to bullet point this, but I still don't see a reason to participate. Just humor me. You're my third attempt at doing this without it going off the rails. 
Well, if you want extravagance, I suppose there is the time I went to that tourist trap. As I recall, you had me sent there to watch over a young woman named Chloe. Okay, good. Keep going. There were a lot of garishly costumed tourists around me. Yet for some reason, they found me to be a popular subject for photography. It's probably your winning personality. I also recall having to spend all of my money simply to stay in a hotel room, keep Chloe safe, and prevent thieves from getting their hands on a necklace. Thieves such as yourself. Oh, is that, that the incident you're talking about? All of this to learn that the entire situation was a decoy. All so you could enjoy yourself on a date. Uh, geez, you sound like a wiki page. So, uh, how did that go again? As it turned out, I met the security agent who liked dressing up as a bunch of grapes later on. And out of sympathy, his firm offered me a favor. What kind of favor? Well... And that's a heat seeker. It's a deck! All right, after those rousing filler shenanigans, we jump back into the main plot, which picks up with Ami at her new boarding school, where she seems to be having a tough time fitting in and making friends, until a strange girl named Dolma starts killing and eating birds in the courtyard, which scares away the other girls, quite reasonably, might I add, and prompts Ami to start up conversation with her, asking her why she would do something that might give the other girls the wrong impression of her, leading her to explain that she doesn't care what they think of her, she'd rather live by her own wants and desires rather than be beholden to normal social conventions. A philosophy pretty similar to something Lupin and especially Fujiko would say, and one Ami can identify with, creating a quick friendship between the two girls. Though there might be more to Dolma than it seems, as Lupin has her pegged as the target of the next heist, or more specifically the necklace she wears known as the Royal Teardrop, but everything goes awry when a terrorist group takes over the school and take Dolma and Ami hostage. Luckily though, thanks to Fujiko infiltrating the school as a teacher, she's able to rescue Ami and together they're able to take down the terrorist leader and save all the girls, with a little bit of help from Lupin and the boys. Though unexpectedly, Unexpectedly, Dolma is taken away by a seemingly hapless teacher who was actually a CIA agent in disguise, with him taking her back to her home country of Padar in order to prevent a civil war in the country. Which leads Lupin and the crew, featuring Ami, to also head to Padar, where we get to see the interesting juxtaposition of the country, which is paradoxically split in half between old traditional values and customs and a futuristic dystopian hellscape, complete with fully autonomous vehicles and run by AI, with technology integrated into pretty much every aspect of life, making an interesting set setting for Lupin and his cohorts to traverse, with us having already seen how oppressive technology can be to Lupin's operations in the first arc. For now though, things are going pretty smoothly, with both the boys and the girls of the crew able to infiltrate the country successfully on their own. Which gives us more time to explore the dynamic between Ami and Fujiko that was somewhat introduced in the first arc and expounded upon a little more during the hostage situation. With it being a dynamic that I really enjoyed, having Ami trying to emulate Fujiko and Lupin to middling success, using her dislike of Fujiko as a motivation, with Fujiko taking on somewhat of a mentor type role and somewhat of an antagonistic role to help drive her as well. Although a bit more laissez-faire than an actual mentor, but together the two of them infiltrate the traditionalist movement of the country being led by the high priest. Because it just wouldn't be a Lupin series without a cult, am I right? With Ami going off on her own to save Dolma, only to be intercepted by the CIA agent from the school. Luckily though, she's saved by Lupin, who infiltrated as Zenigata earlier, and Lupin gets the upper hand on the agent, only for Dolma to come out and shoot Lupin with an arrow, wounding him pretty badly and putting the two of them in a pretty rough position. Until Fujiko swoops in and rescues them both, as well as stealing the royal teardrop, in what I thought was a really cool sequence that shows off Fujiko in a very competent light. With her managing to evade capture and get them all safely to a warehouse, where Fujiko treats Lupin's wounds in a scene that's reminiscent of when they treated Ami's bullet wound in the first arc. Only this time Ami's on the other end of things, trying to help Lupin in an interesting role reversal. Unfortunately for Lupin though, he isn't able to rest long thanks to the country being under martial law and their hideout being leaked to the military. So it's up to Fujiko and Ami to get Lupin to safety once again, which takes him on a pretty cool chase sequence, complete with Ami blowing up a vehicle full of soldiers with a grenade, with no remorse might I add. I mean, jeez Ami, those guys had families. Things get tense after that though, when the soldiers chase the three into the woods and Fujiko seemingly betrays Ami and Lupin to escape herself, hitting Ami pretty hard with it coming right on the heels of her really starting to respect Fujiko, especially since she doesn't know, at least at the time, that she's really acting as a decoy for them. Ending up with Fujiko surrounded by the military in a shack about to be killed when Lupin comes to save her, with a little bit of help from Ami who hacked an airship and sent it to crash down on the soldiers. You know, light work and all that. And the scene ends pretty soon afterwards without us getting to see the resolution until a bit later. But 
before it does, we get a little bit more buildup of the tense relationship between Lupin and Fujiko, where we see a flashback to how they used to be, cutting back to the present where Fujiko asks Lupin what she is to him, with us not really getting to see Lupin's response before we move on to the next thing, which is Lupin and Ami sneaking into the palace once again, under the guise of Ami being Dolma and Lupin being one of the higher up military officers, which as a small little nitpick, I wish they had found a way to introduce as a character before this, so that's a little more obvious what's going on from the outset and a little less obvious it's Lupin in a disguise. Other than that though, their infiltration is great, with Ami proving very useful for getting past the retina scanners that the High Priest has in place to guard a more technologically advanced area of the palace, because apparently the High Priest is using the traditionalist movement as a way to grab more power rather than actually caring about the country's traditions or values, which is even more apparent with the way he treats Dolma, trying to coronate her with a fake royal teardrop, and even going so far as to try and replace her with a double when she refuses to comply. Lucky for her though, Lupin steps in to intervene with him and Ami taking the attention of the High Priest and his soldiers, with the latter getting taken out by not-so-friendly fire as it turns out Jigen and Goemon were hidden amongst the ranks and take them out easily, leaving the High Priest to grovel to Lupin to work for him. And in Lupin's best FMA impression, Ami livestreams it to the whole country, leaving the High Priest to face the repercussions of his actions from its citizens. Unfortunately though, this also puts Dolma in the crosshairs. That is until the CIA agent tries to take her hostage and get away, which ends with him being shot and Dolma delivering a speech condemning the foreign interference. And this was a really great scene for a lot of reasons I haven't really gotten into yet, with Dolma fighting back tears as she speaks because the CIA agent was actually on her side this whole time, trying to help her maneuver into a position where she could save the country from the strife that it's been enduring, which is why Dolma shot Lupin earlier in order to protect him, with his attempt at taking Dolma hostage being the only way he saw to shake off the cloud of doubt around her, in the end giving his life to help Bedard just like he had wished somebody would have done for his country growing up. And the best part is, with Dolma knowing all this the whole time, she's still able to give a rousing speech to end the country's civil war and bring peace, making for one hell of a scene. We also find out afterward, per Dolma's own admission, that she was in love with him, as she confides in Ami, and Ami also tells her about her first love, which is Lupin, as she immediately afterward confesses her love to him. And now, it's time to talk a little bit about something I really don't want to touch on. But but, oh well. I don't like this. I know it's a bit of a cultural difference as well, Ami, and to an extent Dolma are young girls with complex upbringings, especially in Ami's case where a lot of her emotional growth was stunted early on and now that she's been tagging along with Lupin and doesn't really know how to process her emotions correctly and might be confusing admiration with love, I still am not a huge fan. I like it in concept, and I like that Lupin's responsible enough to try and let her down easy and not really entertain the notion as serious. I just don't understand why both Ami and Dolma had to be 14 if they wanted this to be a plot point. Sure, they're young girls going through puberty with complex emotions and hormones mixing around inside them, and sometimes that can manifest in having a crush on an older mentor figure or something like that. But they could have just been 18 and nothing would have had to change. Like. All that would have done is made this plot point less creepy. Still not the greatest thing in the world, but better at least. Or they could have just had Ami admire Lupin as a role model rather than a romantic interest and avoided it altogether. But since she's a female, I guess they felt that they just had no choice. Anyway, that covers my thoughts on that, so now let's talk about the arc as a whole, which I thought was freaking spectacular, aside from a hiccup here or there, with it having the gravitas and structure of a great movie plot, with the arc once again being able to pretty much stand on its own as a solid story, while also having the connective tissue from the first arc, making us more familiar already with Ami, meaning that the writers can focus a little more on the newer characters introduced here, while also allowing the story to stand on its own for somebody that starts with it, with Ami still getting plenty of development through this arc and it being super enjoyable to follow, meaning that people who aren't already familiar with the character can appreciate her character without having seen the first arc, with Ami starting off in the arc trying to act like Lupin and Fujiko would when captured at the beginning, only for it to blow up in her face with her needing to be rescued by Fujiko, who kind of takes her under her wing a little bit, putting her in perilous situations like scaling a tall building and fighting a CIA agent, only for her to still need to be bailed out by Lupin, who gets injured because of it, leading to Ami being in the opposite position of where she was with Lupin last time as Fujiko operates on him, with her by the end using her skills to somewhat stand shoulder to shoulder with Lupin, which is good because to me, Fujiko and Lupin in this arc fell much more stagnant, with their past relationship problems still being mostly a mystery to us, and I really wasn't a fan of the minuscule amount of development that that got in this arc, with it mostly boiling down to vague questions followed by vague non-responses, which is not really a very gripping way to hold my attention, and I would have preferred that it either got a little more focus in the arc, or a little bit less, as just having it in here half-baked felt more like an annoying cliffhanger than an interesting plot point. Other things I did like in this arc though include getting to explore the ecosystem of Padar, with 
Lupin and the boys giving us a view at this super technologically advanced side of things, as Fujiko and Ami spend some time in the more old-fashioned, traditional side of town. And the political maneuvering in the arc was also pretty interesting, at least to me. But I could see if somebody didn't really like this arc a whole lot, as it mostly boils down to Ami, Lupin, and Fujiko, with Dolma and the CIA agent getting some screen time, but not enough that ever really got me too invested in their relationship, with a lot of the crucial moments of it happening off screen and in flashbacks. So I would have much preferred some more focus on that than the Lupin Fujiko story. Also, Zenigata barely even shows up, and when he does, he just talks to Fujiko about Lupin. So I now have it in my head canon that they're off work besties who call each other to complain about Lupin. Other than that, though, Zenigata's biggest contribution to the arc is Lupin disguising as him to get in the palace the first time. As well, Jigen and Goemon at a certain point just kind of disappear until the end. And it would have been nice to have something else to do with them. And maybe if they had taken this plot and actually stretched it into a movie, that could be something that they might add. As it stands, though, it really does feel like this was originally an idea for a movie, but was instead repurposed for the series, in some of the best ways and some not so great ones in my opinion. And although I enjoyed it quite a bit, unlike the first two arcs which I thought were really tight in terms of their themes and characterization, this one felt a bit more shaky in places, so hopefully the final arc will be a bit more solid. Either way, that does it for the Padark, so now it's time to get back to some… filler. With friends like these, am I right, fellas? You know what? I think I'll do this one on my own. So, uh, I suppose there was that one time I decided to solve a murder. Yours truly as a detective on the side of the law for once. Well, kind of. There was this one lady back in my green jacket days I decided to steal from, but for the life of me, I couldn't manage. Boy, was I surprised when she invited me over, offering what I'd been after if I exposed her husband's killer. Then she was killed after inviting the suspects over. Real sneaky fellas, but nothing I couldn't handle. All I needed to do was put on some glasses and don a nom de guerre, Jim Barnett III, borrowing the same name that Gramps used back in the day. In retrospect, terrible idea. I mean, I barely had time to change and there I go copying my grandpa? Ah, yeesh. If the suspects were any smarter, they have found me out instantly. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Ugh, this is why I need a co-host. Right, the murder. Well, I'll just wrap this up and say that I found the perp, let the old lady keep her treasure, and rode off into the sunset or some other movie cliche. The end. And next time I'll be joined by... Not you. Not you. Definitely not you. Well, you're better than nothing, so here goes. And we're recording again, joined remotely by Emmy and Nan. It's Ami, and this is not what I had in mind when you said we would be recording something together. I don't know what you had in mind, and for the love of God, don't elaborate! Remember what I asked you to discuss? Your shortcomings with Fujiko Mine, right? Okay, for the record, that's not what I told you. It may as well be. After all, she told me about a particular occasion that occurred back in Italy. As she described it, she was trying to retrieve a gift you were too drunk to appreciate. Huh? When the hell was that? Allow me to refresh your memory. First, she intruded on your supposedly broken toilet. Second, she seduced you into letting her stay against your friend's wishes. Ami, do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Third, she emerged from the supposedly out-of-order restroom entirely naked in front of Goemon. Now I'm starting to remember. <laughs> Fourth, she challenged you to a game of strip old maid and soundly beat the pants off of you. Okay, that you would think I'd remember. That was wordplay, by the way. I've been working on humor. Good for you. Fifth, she asked for something long and thin and would not elaborate. Six, she threatened okay, to- Okay, this is getting cut right now. I don't know why she told you about this, but she's gone too far. Why did I even ask you to join me on this? Because you said everyone else wanted to either kill you, laugh at you, or arrest you. You weren't wrong. You gonna rub it in some more? I don't have the time. There's a new game I intend to date in mind before release. I can subscribe to Underworld. I don't even... Razzum frazzum gamers. Hmm. Queen takes G8. King to E7. You know, Jigen, I was thinking. A dangerous pastime, my friend. Knight to D5. I know. You remember the last time I played a good game of chess? You don't do it that often. I mean, that's why we're playing to see who makes dinner. True. Pawn to d6. Well, it was in the desert not too long ago. I'd been given a challenge by an eccentric old Wait man a and- Damn it, Lupin, you didn't finish your podcast already? It's not a podcast, and yeah, I'm working on it. Also, your move. Pal, you need to get your priorities straight. 
uh, Bishop takes a5. And as I was saying, the old man was issuing both of us a challenge by bringing in that sniper. Knight takes a5. Queen to d8, check. And as I recall it, I was trying to take a vacation. But I guess at least I was able to find some closure with Mirage. Ah, yes. The sniper was actually the daughter of the one we were expecting, wasn't it? For all we know, she might have even been your kid. King to c5. Lupin, you push that point and you'll be cooking, cleaning, and restocking all of my whiskey in hell. <laughs> <sighs> Queen to e7. And for the record, I'm just glad things went all right, even though you did lose a million euros for us. At least it went to a good cause. King takes c6. Mm-hmm. Queen takes c7. Wait, I think that's checkmate. I <laughs> hope oh, better get to cooking, Lupin. <laughs> Son of a bitch! So, about that time when- Lupin, this had better be the last one. It is, don't worry. And I've actually chosen something kind of nostalgic. Nostalgic how? Goemon, how long have you been there? Long enough. Well, I was actually thinking about Pops. Oh, so your acquaintance is that kind of guy. Yeah, real classy, Jigen. No, it was the time he'd lost his memory and got taken in by that Russian gang. Oh yeah, that time he started out-thieving you? You were so miserable watching him beat you left and right. I remember it more, being concerned for an old friend's well-being. Indeed. And how he had found peace in becoming a superior crook. Superior how? You want the short list or the long one? Only if it's bullet pointed. Nah, let's not get too harsh about it, especially since you accidentally restored Pop's memory by pestering him until he tried to arrest you again. Hey, all's well that ends well, right? Hmm. Maybe he'd had been happier as the crook Manietta than as the inspector we know. Yeah, hey, maybe he could have even joined our gang while you became our nemesis, the great detective Jim Barnett. I will strangle you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I said, who needs friends, am I right? <laughs> God, I hope this was worth it. Wow, those fillers actually seem pretty great. Well, thanks for helping me out with those, good buddy. Next, let's get into the final arc of the series, and oh boy, is it a doozy. Starting off with the Shake Hands Foundation, who we got to know pretty well in the last arc, launching a brand new social media app called People Log, which sounds more like a serial killer's diary than the new Facebook, but hey, what do I know? Especially considering that after its release, it becomes so popular that not even Lupin can escape it. Literally, as in a similar case to what happened in the first arc, Lupin's gone viral once again. This time, though, rather than just having people taking pictures and videos of him. People Log is able to use all the data at its disposal to track his possible escape paths, see through disguises, and even plant a seed of doubt in Goemon about his relationship with Lupin, which will come to a head later. For now, though, Lupin is able to put his mind at ease, although Lupin himself can't be at ease with all the people after him thanks to the help of People Log, especially with him being in the sights of the company president Enzo, with him wanting to take Lupin down to prove the effectiveness of People Log, with him capturing Fujiko in order to goad Lupin into trying to save her. And of course, she has to be naked. Which of course works, and so the crew plus Ami head to the island where Shake Hands' HQ is located in order to siege the building and get Fujiko back. But once they split up, Enzo uses the opportunity to coerce Goyamon into fighting Lupin, using the features on People Log to fool him into believing what it says rather than what he sees and knows. Using Goyamon to make some interesting commentary on the amount and variety of misinformation online, showing how much a confirmation bias can play into believing misinformation as well, with him preferring to believe what an AI generates about his relationship with Lupin rather than Lupin himself. And afterwards, Goemon interrupts an actually interesting scene between Lupin, Fujiko, and Ami, which does a much better job of creating intrigue and suspense while simultaneously fleshing out the previous issues in Lupin and Fujiko's relationship than the last arc did as a whole. Still keeping the conversation somewhat vague, but this time not in the interest of prolonging the mystery and faux tension. Once Goemon arrives, though, he and Lupin have a short but interesting fight in which he emerges as the winner, but rather than enjoy the victory, instead he immediately regrets his actions and wraps Lupin in his bandages, and the shock from the event causes Ami to prostrate herself to Enzo for help, exclaiming that she's his daughter in a surprising revelation. Unfortunately for Ami though, the overarching villain of the series turned out to be an asshole and cares more about People Log's success than the revelation of his long lost daughter, which was actually kind of a great misdirect as it flies right in the face of how Enzo's partner was characterizing him earlier when talking to Fujiko. But that's not Enzo's goal. I really think he just wants to make the world a better place. Huh. Is he a saint or something? He's more human than most, I'd say. 
<sighs> Enzo has a daughter somewhere out there. That's wonderful, Enzo. Yeah, people log finally managed to take Lupin the third down. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Your daughter was alive the entire time. Oh, yeah, that happened too. Huh? What's with you? Stop trying to act tough. Didn't you create people log for the sake of finding your daughter? I suppose that could have been the reason why, but that doesn't matter any longer. And so despite Ami's plea for Enzo to help Lupin, instead he arrives with an armed force to take him away. As well as Goemon who's still coming to terms with his recent defeat of Lupin. With things looking pretty grim for the crew now that Lupin's been injured and captured along with Goemon. While Jigen's on the run from the authorities with seemingly no recourse. That is until Albert shows up and helps him out. Heck yeah! Knew that arc would be good for something. And that's not all Albert does in the finale here either, as later on he ends up recruiting Enzo's partner to help him out in the future. And now some of you might be saying, or have already said, hey, I thought you said Albert doesn't really contribute to the plot past his arc. And it is true that he's doing stuff here, but aside from rescuing Jigen, which is a role pretty much any character could fill, and his recruitment of Enzo's partner at the end, which is ultimately irrelevant, as nothing really comes from it in this series, and now with the power of hindsight, we know the same can be said for the following series. And maybe someday it'll come back up, but we're half a decade removed from part 5 at this point and haven't even seen Rebecca again since. So, while it might seem like it, Albert's really not doing a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. Speaking of which, Rebecca makes a minor cameo at the end here, as well as several old enemies of Lupin, such as... But that's getting a little ahead of things, as two of our boys are still in custody and there's only one man badass enough to save them. And so Jigen lays down an absolutely amazing one-man siege on Lupin and Goemon's armored escort, and I'd just like to take a minute to address this scene and a future scene in particular, as they are quite ridiculous from a realistic perspective. And I know this is Lupin and all, what do you expect? But I do feel that it does kind of go against the more grounded aspects of the series up to this point. Like back in Padar, the crew wasn't laying siege on an army and single-handedly winning a civil war, they did it with cunning and strategy and manipulation. So to see things escalate so radically to a movie-esque Kenichi style of one or two man siege on heavily armored, basically military units kind of feels out of place. But on the other hand, it's really badass and comes with some great animation. So it'll come down to more a matter of opinion on if it's too jarring a shit for you or not. Personally, I love it, but I'm also a big fan of big, bombastic, over-the-top things, even if they don't make the most sense at the end of the day. I mean, either go big or go home, right? And after Jigen saves the boys, he tries to talk Lupin into quitting in light of recent events, to which Lupin responds with an impassioned speech about how he wants to live his life, wanting it to be exciting and unpredictable since he's the only one that gets to experience it. So why bother living a boring life? Saying that until the very end, he'd like to continue being Lupin the third, mostly putting a cap on the theme of what makes Lupin Lupin in a more or less satisfying way, meaning all that's left to do is for the crew to siege the Shake Hands Island one more time and rescue Fujiko and Ami. And luckily, this time Lupin knows where to find some help, as thanks to his many countless exploits, he seems to have a wealth of information about certain countries' secrets, which he posts on People Log with them getting very accurate ratings, something that makes those countries try and crack down on People Log rather than allow it to grow like they were debating earlier. With them launching a full scale invasion on People Log's HQ, while Lupin also just so happens to be there too, with Rebecca tagging along for a brief cameo. And while the HQ is under siege, Goemon and Jigen hold off basically an entire army by themselves while Lupin and infiltrates in the other ridiculously unrealistic action sequence that I mentioned earlier. As well, this is the point where Albert recruits Enzo's partner tying up most other loose ends right before Lupin meets up with Fujiko and Ami and Enzo, where he and Fujiko have a little heart to heart to wrap up the relationship drama between them that we've been building up to all season, with them discussing some interesting stuff like the idea of if men and women can only be friends, as well as Lupin saying that he still doesn't really know himself who Lupin the Third is. But finally, in a grand gesture to show Fujiko how he really feels about her, he takes off his face, which is just a mask revealing his real face and oh boy, do I have a lot to say about that but 
I'll save it for the ending. For now, Lupin and Fujiko's relationship problems seem to be solved, but the problem of escaping the exploding building they're currently in needs some attending to. So Lupin has Ami simulate how the building will fall, which reveals to Enzo that she's been underworld this whole time. And when Lupin and the ladies go to make their escape sliding down the side of the building on cardboard boxes, which as a quick aside is a pretty dope action set piece, uh, Enzo makes his way along with them, telling Lupin now that he knows his secret, his next version of People Log will beat him for sure. Which seems like a great idea to make another version of the app that got you labeled as a terrorist and your company under military invasion, clearly showing Enzo learned a lot from this experience. And Lupin claps back at him, saying he has tons more secrets he doesn't even know about, kind of taking the wind out of the sails of the whole mask off face reveal, with instead of it being Lupin's deepest, darkest secret he only shared with Fujiko, and I guess Enzo and Ami via proximity, becoming just one of many secrets apparently. But oh well, who would want a satisfying resolution to a plot point that's been built up the whole series and not have it be undercut by some humor immediately afterward? Well, I guess it's a good thing it wasn't satisfying in the first place then. And speaking of satisfying resolutions... <laughs> Oh boy, are we down bad. Because after this exchange, Ami goes flying with Lupin unable to save her, only for Enzo to make the save since he's abruptly flipped his switch on giving a fuck about her after finding out she's Underworld and apparently does have use to him. Oh boy, what a great moment, am I right? And after all that, the gang heads off, but not before Lupin invites Ami to join, which to my dismay, she declined, citing to Enzo afterwards her reasons. Yes, I wanna be by his side, but if I'm too close, I get restless. Mm -hmm. I want him to be mine more than anything, but if I had him all to myself, I'd only be disappointed. I want to know everything about him, but I still want him to surprise me. It's strange, isn't it? Ami, there's a perfect word for people like that. Did you know? Huh? There is? They're called heroes. With just another in a non-stop line of banger resolutions in this episode, capping us off with one of the least explored themes in the series. But all's well that ends well, right? Well, no, because now I have to talk about it. One of the most controversial things in all of Loop. Okay, maybe not, but at least to me, Lupin revealing his face to be a mask covering his real face is a very, very strange choice and one I don't like personally. Even if apparently it is canon in the manga and even makes sense in the context of his character to an extent, I've always thought of Lupin as a thief that wouldn't hide his real face like that out of confidence in his abilities, similar to why he would wear a red jacket in the manga and stuff like that. As well as to increase his challenge and notoriety, being someone that doesn't care if the whole world knows knows what he looks like because he'll pull off his heist anyway. It's also just way less personable and I can't really get behind a character I've enjoyed for so long to suddenly not be the person they've always been. But that's just my two cents. Maybe you guys really like that reveal. Let me know what you guys thought of it and while we're at it, why don't we hear what some other nice folks thought of part five. Hello YouTube, Lupin the Third here and my secret is that I'm not Lupin and instead I'm Morkes Moriser. But I could be Lupin according to this finale and that's kind of the problem. I do not like it when stories decide that Lupin the Third is not in fact Lupin the Third. Losing the grandfather loses the point. There are ways to play meta with this concept, like whether Lupin even wants to live up to his grandfather, like in Zero, or Lupin existing in the modern era, like with Part 5. There are also stories about living up to a legacy without having the bloodline or being the exact person, like with Ratatouille or Into the Spider-Verse. To put it mildly, this ain't that, Chief, and without that, why do we care about Lupin's adventures in the modern day anyway? But for the sake of argument, let's say that they had an interesting way to play with it. Well, the secret itself had no setup and the reveal has basically no impact. Other than Elon Zuckerberg liking his daughter now, everything else goes back to status quo as if nothing happened. The secret at the end of part six, on the other hand, was revealed to Lupin, but not the audience. And more importantly, we know that Lupin was able to accept it and move on with his life. Here, it adds nothing, explains nothing, supports nothing, entices nothing, results in nothing, therefore it is nothing, and we've wasted our time on this plot point. What a slap in the face. This is Marisa the Third signing off. Toodles. Hehehehe. <laughs> this is Cloud Connection with a dramatic reading of Loop on the Third Part 5 Finale, a play in one act. <clears throat> Hi there, I'm Cloud Connection. So we're talking about the part five finale, huh? What a fascinating ending to a kind of all over the place series. For a show that was interested in exploring who Lupin was as well as celebrating all of his adventures, I think this is a brilliant way to end it. I love how the reveal of Lupin's face is executed. It's not built up because what Lupin actually looks like isn't the point. 
This moment is his chance to prove to Fujiko, a woman he has toyed with and been dishonest to on multiple occasions, that he is who he is. The audience doesn't need to know what Fujiko sees, what's important is that she sees it. That is a lovely way for these characters to establish trust. Ami and Enzo's storyline wraps up fine enough, I suppose. It's not bad or anything, just a simple way to put a bow on that relationship. But considering how simultaneously huge and understated that loop on reveal is, I respect the hell out of this ending. It's not gonna work for everyone, but I absolutely love it. And so that does it for Lupin the Third Part 5. Really kind of a mixed bag at the end of the day, with some stuff I really loved about it, but also some of the most, at least in my opinion, egregious plot points and resolutions I've seen so far in modern Lupin. Which really sucks because where I thought series like Parts 4 and 6 had some pretty average build up to both good and average endings, here Part 5 really had me on the hook with how well everything was established and paced. With the writers using the series' original characters, sans yada, to much better effect here than before. I felt. With the use of Ami as a dual protagonist kind of mirroring Rebecca from part 4 but with a bit more depth to her here, as well as Albert making for an intimidating antagonist only to be mostly thrown to the wayside after his arc concludes. But whereas I felt part 4's ending was pretty solid if not a bit rushed at the end, as well as part 6's payoffs to the two respective main plot points being a bit unsatisfying but mostly working in the context of the series, here it felt like total whiplash, moving from the slower pace the rest of the show had taken until the end to all of a sudden big movie ending with very very unsatisfying payoffs to it all. However, one thing I will say is it's not the worst thing ever, at least to me, as luckily while most if not all the arcs in the series do flow into each other in a very natural way, they also work well as standalone arcs in their own right, meaning that if you did want to revisit the series to experience the excellent pacing, plot, and characters at play, without having the looming fear of a rushed, unsatisfying ending hanging over it all, you could absolutely do that. And that alone I feel is worthy of praise, as the team of writers, directors, animators, voice actors, and so on came together to put a really solid intro into the modern Lupin era, and in my opinion, it succeeded nearly flawlessly. And while I do wish the ending could have been different, I'm sure there's plenty of you out there that didn't really mind or even love the ending. And at the end of the day, whether I liked it or not, it was still a damn fun ride, and really, that's all I'll ever ask from Lupin. Also, the OVA's alright, wasn't too big a fan of it, but I'll talk more in depth about it in another video, or something. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. This was a long one, but I felt that was the only way to do this series justice. So I appreciate it if you watched all the way to the end here, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe as well as leave a comment and let me know what you guys thought of part five. Also check out all these other amazing people I put on screen for more great content. I couldn't have done this without them and an extra special thanks to Morquez for all the help. See you guys next time for part six. It's Ami. And this is not what I had in mind when you said we would be blah, 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 blah. Let Ami try that again.